All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gene, and this is going to be my English language testimony for January's Uyghur Pulse uh, project. Um, so um, today I'm going to talk um, about a case that's, I mean, like a number of cases, but one that's still kind of personally close to me for certain reasons. And that's one of uh, Abdurrahman Mehmet from Turpan. So here's his photo and I'm going to testify for him. I don't know him personally, uh, but his story is actually very special. He wasn't never sent to, as far as I know, any sort of camp. He was actually outside, uh, quote unquote, outside until uh, the middle of, of, uh, of 2019, until June of July of 2019. And so basically what happened with him, and so here I'm also going to show his um, Chinese ID. Some things have been a bit striped out, but anyway, we know the real ID. Um, so what happened with him is that he actually had these three letters um, from camp written by his two by his parents, one by, I think, either his older brother or his uncle that were sent to him. And these are very kind of, very interesting letters. I'll read one, uh, I guess, uh, shortly. And um, he shared them in 2018 with his cousin in, uh, in Japan. And last year in July, in 2019, his cousin in Japan shared them with Shahid Biz. And uh, these are very interesting letters. They're actually, I think, they're the only cases that we know of, of letters from camp that have surfaced. And so they're very extremely important evidence um, and hopefully will be used as such. And they're not actually, I mean, there's nothing criminal about sharing them because what they do is they basically repeat all the same propaganda that, um, that the Chinese government has been, you know, spreading for the past, you know, year or so. But uh, because he shared them with his um, his cousin, and then later his cousin shared it with Shahid Biz. Shahid Biz posted them. I translated them. I perhaps you know I don't know if this was the right decision or not, but I shared them on social media. Then they spread, and then two days later, uh, Abdurrahman was called in by the police and asked who he shared the letters with, and was detained afterward for this reason. So we still believe that he's in. Uh, in a police detention center and pre-trial detention possibly we don't know if he, maybe he's been sentenced uh, so again this is something i feel personally responsible for in fact uh, partially responsible for but anyway basically yeah he shared these letters uh, he was arrested for it uh, at least once they surfaced and once they went online he was arrested in uh, july of 2019 and um I will first read the letter from his mother to kind of give you a sense of what these letters, the content of these letters, uh, because I think it is very important. It's extremely, extremely illustrative. And uh, then I'll kind of, I'll give you the follow-up to his uh, to his story. So the letter I'll read right now. So it's uh, titled just Letter to Relatives. It's addressed to the Gaochan district, to Putao town, to Bulak village in Turpan, uh, to Abdurrahman Mehmet, the person that I'm testifying for. And this is an English translation, which is more or less correct. Um, and this is how it goes. Dear children, how are you? How's your health? Mine is as good as it was the last time we met. Let me tell you about this vocational school. The dormitories are in good condition. Hot water runs 24 seven. There are bathrooms, heated floors, and air conditioning. We are provided with food, shelter, clothing, and other products of daily, daily use. The learning materials are all free. In January 2000, uh, January 3rd, on January 3rd, 2018, I left home to come to the vocational school. I did so because I had previously gone abroad. I had gone on a pilgrimage. It's actually not clear, I think, if, it's, if it was a pilgrimage to Mecca or if it was um, just one of these kind of local shrine pilgrimages maybe that Uyghurs are known to make in any case yeah my wrongful action violated articles 123 and 124 of the penal code of the people's republic of china according to the law i was to be given a sentence ranging from five to ten years in prison however the party and the government were merciful and i was merely sent for vocational training 
The care that I received from my teachers made me understand that my actions in the past were wrong. I am regretting what I did. I let the party and the government down. I let the society down. I let my past actions undermine social stability. The lectures I attended at the school enlightened me about the cancerous nature of extremist religious ideology with regards to the prosperity of the people. It hampers the development of society and the happiness of the people. It destroys ethnic harmony. From now on, I shall stand on the front lines, promoting the knowledge of the national language and the law to all of my relatives. I am grateful to the party and government for giving me the opportunity to change. I will always follow the party. I will always listen to the party. I will be grateful to the party and will act in a way that is beneficial to ethnic harmony and social stability. I am extremely proud to be a citizen of the People's Republic of China. Children, don't worry about me. We will write to each other soon. And then signed, Aishim Han Yasen, and then her ID number from which we see that she is over 60 years old. And from, as I understand, not in great health, but yet she spent, you know, something like a year in this, uh, in this center. So as you see that this is basically not so different from what you hear from the Chinese propaganda, what you hear from people who, you know, talk to the outside world in Xinjiang, kind of these prepared people who talk to the outside world in Xinjiang say. But because Abdurrahman shared it through this unofficial channel, and it was presented through this unofficial channel, channel even though we didn't mistranslate, we didn't, you know, mess anything up, you know, we didn't, we didn't use it as, propag as a propaganda tool, we didn't, you know, add anything beyond what was already in the text. Uh, and the, the fact that there was nothing, you know, there's nothing really secret in this either, you know, despite all of that, he was arrested. Probably, you know, for quote unquote leaking state secrets or whatever. So um, after this, after we kind of confirmed that he was arrested, we started um, myself, a few volunteers, also his cousin in Japan, we all started calling the local Turpan police and trying to put pressure on them and asking them where he was, what had happened. And uh, as time went on, they kind of, uh, at first they told us that, um, I mean, basically the, now they rarely pick up the phone. Uh, at the beginning, they picked up sometimes and there were a few interesting conversations, but usually they would tell you, look, if you want to come and ask about him, just you have to come here yourself. We cannot give you any information on the phone. Uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot even give you the the phone number of the local police station that would be kind of in charge of him. You, you know, we cannot provide that either. So they were not at all forthcoming. Uh, and one point, you know, after one of these discussions, you know, about seven or eight hours later, I called them and they actually told me that they were a funeral home. I asked them, what do you mean funeral home? And they said, well, this is a, this is a place where we burn corpses. You called the wrong number. I am pretty sure this was the police station telling us that we were calling the wrong number and that they were actually a funeral home. A few other people called after that uh, for two or three days. And on a number of occasions, they said that they said the same thing. This is a funeral home. You call the wrong number. Finally, then two or three days later, they suddenly became a uh, police station again. So voila. Uh, and since then, we've been calling them on and off. We've been trying to do it regularly, uh, not as frequently as we should be, I think, recently. But still, uh, we've been, you know, trying to keep up that pressure on them. And uh, but it's hard. It's hard because they don't uh, pick up the phone a lot of the times. Uh, sometimes they pick up. Um, they don't say anything, so you can actually hear them sitting there for a few seconds. You can hear the background noise, and then they just hang up, and voila. Sometimes you just call and call and call, and nobody picks up. And this is the police, you know. This is kind of the this is the public security bureau that should be, you know, online 24/7 in case something happens. And they're not forthcoming. They don't talk to you. And then you know we still hear reports that you know Xinjiang is open, that people should ask the Xinjiang authorities before they spread rumors. Da 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 da. Well, we can't ask the authorities because when we try to, they just hang up or make applies and say that they're a funeral home. So uh, I want to finish this video by 
again, addressing everybody in general to speak up more, talk about people that are cases that are important to you, that you care about, or as well and as well as the Chinese authorities, you guys have to let Abdurrahman go because we're not going to stop following his case. Uh, or if you're not going to let him go, uh, please be more forthcoming and provide more information. It clearly says what he did wrong, you know, how serious it is, why that's a crime, etc. Because as far as we understand, his only crime was sharing these letters, which aren't exactly top secret material. They're extremely important evidence to show how people in the camps think, but this is basically what the propaganda that you've been spewing out says anyway. So, nothing really top secret there. Anyway, that's my testimony. All the best, and yeah, take care.